Hi, thanks for taking a minute to watch this video. I'm Phil Hunter, the pastor of Citrus Grove Church here in Wesley Chapel, uh, Florida, and I'm gathered, I'm in the place where we gather weekly on Sundays at 9.30, Pinecrest Academy on Highway 54. It'd be great for you to join us. This is where we, we worship, where we uh, have a bunch of, let me see, plans for activities out in our neighborhood coming up next weekend. You're invited to join us for everything. Um, the best way to do that is to join us here on Sunday or to use the contact information next to this video and, and get in touch with me. Let's dive into the same part of the Bible where we left off last week. Uh, we're in a, a new book. We've been in Luke for a long time, and now we're in the little book of Micah that will take us right up to Christmas. Uh, so uh, we're in chapter 3 of the book of Micah. You can look it up on, online, use the links here. Let me ask you, how furious do you get over injustice? If you saw at the store this Black, Black Friday weekend, you were shopping and the, the person in front of you was getting ripped off. They were overcharging her at the, the checkout line. Would you join her in complaining? Would you raise a fuss until everything was put right because you just can't stand injustice? Or would you kind of figure, oh, that's her problem? Or how about if it hits closer to home? If a member of your family, say, was arrested for something he did not do, and you find out later it was because of a, a neighbor who just never liked him for whatever reason. Maybe he had dogs that barked at the wrong time or something. And, and this neighbor filed a false report, really made it up about your, your brother. And so your brother was arrested, and it, it goes as a mark on his, his otherwise spotless record. Maybe this person had friends in high places and was able to call in some favors and, and get this thing done that was just not right. Wouldn't you be outraged about that? Rightfully so? Well, that's the position that God finds himself in. He has been there. He has been outraged over injustice. And it sounds strange that God could be outraged about our human injustices, but he... He does. It really was why he sent a man named Micah to speak up and, and write down this message that we're going to hear in a second, which comes down to stop this, this rot, this corruption that you have gotten so used to. And most of all, here's where it hits home for God. Stop mistreating my family. Listen to Micah chapter 3. Then I said, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, should you not embrace justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones, who eat my people's flesh and strip off their skin and break their bones in pieces, who chop them up like meat for the pan, like flesh for the pot. Then they'll cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. At that time, he will hide his face from them because of the evil they have done. This is what the Lord says. As for those prophets who lead my people astray, they proclaim peace if they have something to eat, but prepare to wage war against anyone who refuses to feed them. Therefore, night will come over you without visions and darkness, without divination. The sun will set for those prophets. And the day will go dark for them. The seers will be ashamed and the diviners disgraced. They will all cover their faces because there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, who, who despise justice and distort all that is right who build Zion with bloodshed and Jerusalem with wickedness. Her leaders judge for a bribe, her priests teach for a price, and her prophets tell fortunes for money. Yet they look for the Lord's support and say, It's not the Lord among us. No disaster will come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion will be plowed like a field. Jerusalem will become a heap of rubble the temple hill, a mound overgrown with thickets. So listen up. I'm furious because you're not being honest 
with the people I love, and worse. Because of all this, a few things are going to happen to you. Verse 7, God says he won't answer their prayers anymore. And verse 12, he says that their capital city on a mountain is going to get bulldozed into a junkyard. Basically, God's saying, I gave you that capital city and this promised land, and I can take you out of it. You've moved so far away from me, my words have become a joke to you, and I won't hesitate to let some invader walk in and walk all over you because of the way you're treating my family. Before we talk about the specifics of what these leaders were doing, let me pause to remind you, this is here in your Bible for one reason, to give you hope. How? How can hearing about how angry God got at this injustice, this unfairness and the bribery by rulers and spiritual hucksters 800 years ago in Israel, uh, 800 years before Jesus in Israel, so 2,800 years before right now, how can hearing that give you hope today and hope for tomorrow? Well, because God cares about it. He notices it. He loves the believing widow who loves the Lord and his word, and he hates that she's being swindled and taken advantage of. He hated it then, he hates it now. He hates to see people go to church and there be misled or fleeced. He hates it. He hates it. Yes, he's a God of love, but love includes fiercely defending your people against uh, what is attacking them from what um, if these are people who are are depending on you so of course god springs to their defense what father could smile and just ignore the injustice happening against his children not our god so take hope god knows what is happening and he notices all of it it's not getting by uh, getting past him. It's not getting past him at all. And, and no one gets away with anything forever. People can fool other people. And they can run roughshod over people in a weaker position than them. But nothing get pa gets past our God. At certain points in life, you may just have to be content with the justice that God will dispense at his time. In Romans 12, in fact, we're encouraged to leave room for God to be God. It's not our job to even every score or to get revenge in the right amount until we're happy. Instead, as far as it depends on us, we aim to live at peace with everyone. And we can be so confident in God's ultimate justice that we can even give food and water to people who hate you. And if our kindness to them makes them even more mad at us, well, okay. We resolve not to be overcome by evil, but we'll overcome evil with good. And maybe as they see us, they'll wonder what's different about us and makes us tick. What gives us such peace and confidence? What gives us such hope for tomorrow in the face of such injustice? We can tell them. Jesus does. Let's talk more specifically about what was going wrong in, in this society. Starting with verse 1 of chapter 3, God is laying out evidence against those in charge, people with authority and influence and power. And he phrases his whole list here as a question where he expects more from them. After all, these are supposed to be the people with, with a good grasp of morals and, and God's commandments. They should hold to his words. They should live like people who, who understand the mercy of the Lord their God. Shouldn't they? So why don't they? Shouldn't they want their society to be fair? Shouldn't they hate evil and love good instead of doing the opposite? Later on in, in verse 5, we're going to find out that the priests were pastoring the people only as much as they thought they were worth. Uh, buy me a nice dinner and I'll tell you a nice message from God. Uh, they save their harsh words for people who won't bribe them. This is so wrong. God is totally done with them. He is dragging, they're dragging God's name through the mud. God says they will all cover their faces. And the Hebrew expression is they'll cover their mustaches. 
maybe it just looks like this as they're just shaking their heads and just shocked and appalled that everything that they had built is going to crumble around them. They're going to be at a total loss. Uh, and it's not going to be a great look for people who are supposed to be in touch with God that they will get no answer from God. And God says, away from me, I don't know you. The funny thing is, for all these corrupt judges and prophets, they all kind of figure they're safe. We're the city of God. No one can touch us. God will keep us safe while we're doing whatever we want to to get ahead. Micah is the one voice in the city, I guess at, at this point, who, like he says in verse 8, is filled with the Spirit to declare sins to sinners, to hold up an honest mirror so that people can see how ugly the picture is right now. And hopefully, the hope is, they'll change. This is really a section about Christians abusing and abandoning their responsibility to handle the word of God faithfully. And sad to say there are so many examples of that. We don't have to defend every action of every Christian or every church, needless to say. Church leaders that have protected abusers, pastors who show favoritism, churches that have dumped whole parts of the Bible that they don't like in favor of preaching something else that they do like. Any time a Christian figures that, well, God will always smile on me, God will always support me in our movement because of our membership or because of the important role I play in my church, it's just not true. Those who mistreat and mislead God's family need, hear, need to hear God's anger at them over their sin so that they stop the evil they are doing. God is fiercely defensive of his family. That's love. God's judgment on the corrupt, abusive rulers is going to be exile. He tells them right up front what it will be, exile. Peace is not in the cards anymore. So prophets who were prophesying peace, everything will be okay, they were just schmoozing. They were covering up, and it's not going to be peace. That was a lie. So Babylon is going to come in and cart the people off to think for 70 years about just what went wrong. And in a strange way, this will, this will save his people who are suffering. It will save them from that suffering by, by whisking them away to somewhere else. Or maybe they're going to find more fairness, more justice for a change. You can see in this perhaps a reflection of God driving Adam and Eve out of the broken paradise garden of Eden to keep them from eating from the tree of life and living like that forever. He... He had a better plan, a better story for them. He held out to them the promise of a better eternal life without the sin. And that's the hope of, of coming back home, the hope of a tomorrow. And chapter 4 of Micah's book is God's promise and God's plan to bring his exiles home. Listen to that now. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares. They can guard it instead of fight. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Everyone will sit under their own vine and under their own fig tree. And no one will make them afraid. For the Lord Almighty has spoken. All the nations may walk in the name of their gods, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief, I will, I will make the lame my remnant, those driven away into a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. As for you, watchtower of the flock, stronghold of daughter Zion, the former dominion will be restored to you. Kingship 
will come to daughter Jerusalem. Why do you now cry aloud? Have you no king? Has your ruler perished? That pain seizes you like that of a woman in labor. Writhe in agony, daughter Zion, like a woman in labor, for now you must leave the city to camp in the open field. You will go to Babylon. There you will be rescued. There the Lord will redeem you out of the hand of your enemies. But now many nations are gathered against you. They say, let her be defiled, let her eyes gloat over Zion. But they do not know the thoughts of the Lord. They do not understand his plan, that he has gathered them like sheaves to the threshing floor. Rise and thresh, daughter Zion, for I'll give you horns of iron, I'll give you hooves of bronze, and you will break to pieces many nations. You will devote their ill-gotten gains to the Lord, their wealth to the Lord of all the earth. The book of a different prophet, Isaiah, includes by far the most promises of a savior, prophecies. And they're often pointed out as Jesus was crossing things off his list in the biographies, the gospels. Matthew or Luke will write, this happened just as it was prophesied by Isaiah. Well, Micah was a much shorter book and definitely has fewer exact predictions about the Savior. But still, Micah has been called little Isaiah. The two lived at the same time, and some of these verses we just heard in Micah 4 are almost identical to part of, of Isaiah chapter 2. So what do we make of that? It's possible that Micah knew of a, a prophecy that God spoke through Isaiah. And now Micah is using his voice to amplify it out to even more people than who heard it from Isaiah. Or could it be that Isaiah was the one who used his bigger platform to echo what his faithful colleague Micah had written? Or maybe God gave both of them the same message in similar words. They lived at, a similar, at the same time. And God told both of them, I want both of you to speak to the people around you the same message. It, it could be any of the above. We don't know. The most important part for us is knowing that we are included in the promises God makes here through his servants, both Isaiah and Micah. We are the other nations, the other peoples who stream to the word of the Lord that has rung out starting at Jerusalem, where Jesus was uh, near where Jesus was born and where Jesus died, was buried, and rose. We are the warriors who will eventually lay down our swords and spears, and we're the retirees who will enjoy uh, the, the fruit of trees and a perfect garden in perfect peace and safety in heaven. All the nations may walk in the name of their own gods, and plenty of people will worship plenty of other things, but like God's followers of all time periods, we vow to walk in the name of, uh, of the Lord our God forever and ever. You, friends, you are the exiles who have passed through grief and sadness and sickness and loneliness whose feet can hardly go on anymore. And God calls you his remnant, the handful who will remain after everybody else is gone, who stays faithful. If anyone dares to threaten or attack you, they are the ones in trouble because the Lord will judge them and deliver you his children. One more thing. Kingship will come to you, daughter Zion, says verse 8 of Micah 4. 800 years later, a king would be born in, in Jerusalem, and a different king called Herod would be panicked when he heard from some men arriving from faraway lands, a new king is born. A woman has been in labor and has given birth to a new king, and he will be panicked, and the experts will be panicked, and they will look around, and they'll find in the very next chapter of, of Micah that we'll get to next time we open this book, they'll find the answer of where. But this, here in chapter 4, is the verse that clues them in, that as they watch over their flocks, they should be on the lookout for the arrival of their king. The Lord is near to them to give them hope. The Lord is near to you to give you hope through his promises. He cares about you. He will make sure that you have a home to come back to where no corruption can do you wrong, where no abuse can follow you around and bother you, where no one will be able to lie to you about what God says because God himself will rule in his kingdom and he will be the perfect leader like you've never once had in this world.
and you will walk in the name of the Lord your God forever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. Take care, friends, and talk to you next time. Bye-bye.